so nine years ago this summer, uh, I had a freshly minted PhD in uh, finance from the University of Arizona, and I was about to post to my first academic job at Utah State University. And uh, my first uh, academic teaching assignment was to teach the graduate level sequence in econometrics. Um, and to tell you the truth, I had a little bit of PTSD from my own learning experience coming through graduate school with that particular sequence. And I was searching about for um, a new way, a new, a new way to teach econometrics and deliver it. Um, and as I was searching, I was very fortunate to come across this, uh, what to me is a very important paper by Peter Kennedy. Um, and Kennedy contends that uh, we should teach statistics and econometrics uh, especially the, the convergence concepts, asymptotics, with Monte Carlo simulation. And that this helps the students bridge the gap of uh, the concepts and, and uh, connect with those concepts in a much more meaningful way um, than just the, the symbolic uh, mathematical representation. Uh, he, he contends that most students, after even several courses in statistics and econometrics, don't fully internalize the main ideas of econometrics. And my teaching experience is that that's very much the case. Um, and he points out that the, the crucial concept for students to learn that defines statistical thinking as separate from the mathematical representation is that of the uh, sampling distribution concept. And simulation with the Monte Carlo method is particularly uh, a powerful tool for that. Uh, this paper sent me on a nine-year intellectual journey that uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit about today. Um, but let me start with a demonstration. Imagine that your students of mine, maybe in an introductory statistics or econometrics class, and my task on the day is to teach you about the law of large numbers. I could put up a definition from a textbook like this with uh, some, some words and, and a definition, some mathematical representation. I could go more in depth with probability convergence concepts. But my experience is when I put slides like, like this one and the next one up, that my students' eyes glaze over. And, I, and they don't connect with the material in any meaningful way. And I tend to lose them. Um, uh, imagine instead that uh, I just start with a simple example. Everyone's seen the, the example um, from a baby statistics class of starting with uh, rolling a fair die that has six sides and equal probability for each of the outcomes. We can calculate with simple mathematics the expected value of the population of being 3.5. Of course, uh, we can verify this in, in Python with some simple calculations so that the students can uh, verify this for themselves. Um, but even more meaningful, I can only after a little bit of uh, instruction about uh, Python have them run a simulation like this. So uh, what this simulation does is it rolls the die uh, a certain number of times and takes the average. And what we see plotted is on the horizontal axis, the sample size and the dot on the vertical axis is going to be the average taken from that size. So um, they say don't run code in a presentation, but I'm going to risk it. So imagine that we start with uh, sample size is 1 to 10. So each of those 10 points is an average uh, taken from rolling the die that many times. Um, and what I can do for my students is simply uh, increase the number of sample size runs that I do. And you can start to visually see the convergence. If we uh, go to 1,000, the the story became, be, be, begins to be pretty clear here. We can see this. If I, I'll stop at 10,000 because I don't want it to run and run. Um, but in, the, in this funnel-like shape of the graph, the students can immediately play with and interact with and connect with the concept of the um, law of large numbers here. We see that the sample average, as the sample size increases, converges to the true population size. And so my experience has, has confirmed uh, Peter Kennedy's contention that teaching with simulation methods is a powerful pedagogical tool. And I'm going to talk about how I've incorporated that in teaching computational finance. <clears throat> so uh, the year after I arrived, one of my next uh, academic assignments was to create a new course that hadn't been taught before in computational finance uh, for our master's program. 
But this, uh, this created a bit of a conundrum because most of my students had never programmed before. They are trained in economics and in finance and have never coded before. And what I wanted to avoid was the situation where at the end of the semester they feel a little bit like Delmar here. I don't know if you've seen this particular clip from this film, but um, Delmar is a little left out of the storyline. Um, and I don't want the kinds of abstractions that they're going to see in programming um, to leave them behind. And what I want to do is, is use this as an opportunity to help them to learn to think in a new way. And so one of the question becomes, uh, what is the adequate level of abstraction to think about options and option pricing, which is one of the topics that we're going to, to learn about in uh, the computational finance course. Um, by and large, the students come into my course with pretty strong math and st statistics skills, um, pretty, pretty deep background as far as that goes. But as I said, most of them have never done any kind of programming. And um, so my job is for the first third or so uh, part portion of the course to teach them to program. And um, my objective is to use this as an opportunity. It's, it, it is certainly a challenge, but it can also be an opportunity to help them to learn to think in a new way that will augment and add to their mathematical and statistical thinking. Um, this has been ref uh, referred to as computational and inferential thinking. Um, and of course, Python is an excellent tool for this. Um, it's designed for learners, but they'll never outgrow it. And so uh, it's, it's, it's been a very powerful tool for the first third of the course to get them up to speed in basic programming and then uh, to launch into uh, computational finance concepts. Um, and again, as I say, I want to have them, up, rather, not just having a list of skills on their resume, uh, Python is, is wonderful, as you know, but I want them to leave with a new way of thinking about uh, the world. Um, and uh, whereas uh, Kennedy is oriented towards econometric students, and he wants them to think about the concept of the sampling distribution, um, which turns, to, turns out to be perfect for teaching econometrics, at least of the, of the classical variety, I need to adapt this a little bit. I want students to think about what we might call the predictive distribution, because in finance we're always predicting forward a random variable, a random outcome, and I want them to be able to think about the payoff of an asset in terms of that predictive density, but I can make a, a strong connection to Peter Kennedy's sampling distribution. And the Monte Carlo method turns out to be a very powerful uh, uh, tool for that as well. Um, so I'll ask you, if you can, it's a little bit hard for, for those who have uh, many years of experience, but to think back to the time when you were first learning to program for the first time, and you came across concepts like variables and control flow and functions, and how these new kinds of, of uh, ways of thinking, these new abstractions sort of changed your brain a little bit, rewired, re rewired your, your, your neural network. Um, and I get to see this every semester as the students come in and are learning to think in a new way every, t every, every, uh, every fall semester. I myself learned to program with these intro books, and they were wonderful, uh, with, with little toy games. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you to think about what it was like to, 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 to be a student maybe sitting in my class. I also remember the summer that I decided to dive into Mark Joshi's book on design patterns and object-oriented programming for option pricing. Um, and I wanted to be able to deliver this to the students, but in a more accessible way. Uh, C++ is, is, it would be a very powerful tool. It's a kind of a gold standard in computational finance. But it's a little bit inaccessible for my students never having programmed before. But I wanted to sort of introduce some of these concepts, especially the idea of design patterns uh, with, with object-oriented programming. Um, and so I want to introduce you to uh, the module that my students and I build each semester together from the ground up. It's for educational purposes. It's to help the students understand um, a little bit about how to do some design in their programming uh, oriented towards option pricing, but it's, it's not really geared towards uh, production or research, um, although on my last slide I'll mention a project that's, that's moving Probo in that direction. Um, so the first place to start is to help the students conceive of an option contract um, outside of their textbook in, in 
in some representation in code. And so I begin with them with the uh, facade design pattern. And so here we have uh, the option facade class, and it composes three objects, the option, which is going to rep represent the option contract. Um, what we're calling engine here is going to be a pricing engine, and that sort of abstracts out uh, the idea of a, of a pricing model. And then uh, the, the data object is going to represent market data. We end up not doing much with that, but I'll mention it a little bit later. And then there's a single method, the price method, and it's going to call out to the engine's calculate method. And because Python is um, so simple and, and, and uh, easy to present, this almost pro provides the students with a domain-specific language to price an option and to help them think about that in, an, in a, as I say, a new way, um, a, a new m mode of abstraction. Um, so for those not familiar with what an option is, here's the textbook definition. It's the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell uh, another asset called the underlying asset at a preset time, at a preset price. Um, there are variations on that, but that's the simplest definition. So a call option is going to be the right to buy the underlying asset, a put the, the, the right to sell it. The strike price will be the preset price of the underlying asset, and the expiry is going to be the date of, uh, of exercise, it, at least if it's a, a European option. So how can we represent this in code? Um, we start by uh, creating a simple interface for the option contract that we can use derived classes to specialize. And so I get to explain to the students the concept of an interface and, and help them think about that level of abstraction of, of, of something that can uh, represent different kinds of option contracts. And I'll, I'll draw your attention to the, to the method, the payoff. That's going to be the, the key way to help them think about um, uh, how to price the option is through its payoff function. So <clears throat> here's a, a simple concrete class uh, called, which we, we call here the vanilla option, uh, simply because it's the simplest kind. Um, and what I'll draw your attention here to is in the payoff method, uh, I'm simply calling out to a composed object payoff, and that's going to allow us, um, I'll, I'll give a, a, a second more here just to look at the code, but that that's going to allow us to use the strategy pattern so that at uh, runtime, we can swap out uh, the payoff function for different kinds. And um, this turns out to be really simple in Python because functions are first class objects and I don't have to create a higher level ab uh, uh, object to, to pass into um, the option contract. So I can create two simple one line functions to represent a call and a put option. And by this time, students are pretty um, familiar with writing functions, and this turns out to be a pretty ec uh, easy exercise for them. Um, so a simple demonstration of, of instantiating these so we can create a, uh, a vanilla call option um, with here with a spot price of uh, $41. Uh, the, ex the expiry will, will be the 1.0. That's one year to expiration and with a, a strike price of $40, and then I can simply pass the call payoff function uh, to get the call uh, payoff behavior. And um, I can do the same thing for the put option. Here I've changed the spot price so that we have a more interesting payoff. And students can play with this in the notebook and get familiar with it and, and really connect with the definition of what an option is, and, and these tools provide uh, a very powerful pedagogical environment for students to learn and, and sort of beyond the, the austere representation in the textbook to get to know what uh, options are all about. Um, so the, the next uh, biggest part of the course that we're going to do is spend some time on developing different option pricing models, which we're going to represent here as pricing engines, again, just to help them maybe understand and begin to use some of the lingo that's used on the street. Um, but option pricing models are not unique, and I want to think, have them think about that in an abstract way. And so once again, we're going to use the strategy pattern. Um, and so we'll create a simple interface for the pricing engine with a single method called calculate. And this allows flexibility to represent different kinds of uh, pricing models. So it could be an analytic 
model like the Black-Scholes model, or it could be a new, simple numerical model like the binomial model or even a, a PDE solver. Um, one in particular that, that I'll be showing you is the Monte Carlo pricing model, a uh, simple form of that. Um, so here is a particular pricing engine, the Monte Carlo engine. And again, if we look at the calculate method, we can see that it's calling out to the composed object pricer. And that, again, makes it for the students so that um, uh, creating different uh, option pricing algorithms um, is as easy as writing different uh, functions. And so uh, let me give just a little bit of mathematical review, not too much. I don't want to go too in-depth, but um, to explain a little bit what's going on with uh, Monte Carlo option pricing. Um, we can, we can take uh, Peter Kennedy's uh, idea about teaching econometrics with uh, Monte Carlo method and simulation and apply that, uh, again, adapting it to think about the predictive density for the option. It turns out that, um, that uh, an option uh, can be thought of as the present discounted value of an average payoff under, under many thousands of simulations. So the term in the parentheses is going to be the average payoff at the time of expiry. So M here is going to be some big enough number for the, for the law of large numbers to work. And um, the term in the front, e to the negative RT, is going to represent a, a, a discounted uh, value. Um, and so uh, with that as background, I can now show the simple function that students can write. Um, and, and again, at this point in the course, they're pretty adept at being able to write something like this, like just a few lines of code to represent uh, the Monte Carlo option pricing method. The block of code in the middle there, the, the middle line represents the, the simulation. This is vectorized, so we're running many thousands of uh, simulations here at the same time. So Z is going to be the, an, an array the num uh, that's replications long, and so that will drive many thousands of payoffs. I can take the average and discount it, and I've got uh, an option price. So we can, we can test this pretty simply um, uh, for a European option um, using the, the naive Monte Carlo method. So we'll do some imports from Probo. Um, yeah, maybe I'll take a second now and tell you about market data. It doesn't do much right now except for abstract away the, the other bits of uh, market data that are needed to price the option. But at, at this point, the students understand that the idea of abstraction and I can tell them that this might represent a historical database. Maybe it's streaming data from Bloomberg. The, the students have access to the Bloomberg terminal. Um, this last semester actually did have a student um, uh, put behind the market data object uh, a SQL historical database, and we could use this to price historical options. Um, but typically, that's just a, a small way to encapsulate those bits of data that are needed. So here I'm going to. Um, get the, the different bits that are needed, the Monte Carlo engine and the naive Monte Carlo pricer. And I can set up the market data. This is an example that comes out of their textbook, so they're very familiar with it. They, they've calculated it by hand. They know the answer a priori um, with something like the Black-Scholes model or the binomial model. So they have an idea about what the pricing method should, um, the answer that it should yield. Um, and then we can uh, set up here the option, both a put and a call option. Um, and here, so we've got a one year to expiry, a $40 strike, strike price, and I can instantiate the, the call and the put objects. And um, here I'll just run 100,000 simulations using that naive Monte Carlo pricer, um, build the pricing engine, and um, then we can use the option facade to encapsulate the, the call option, the pricing engine, and the market data, and call out to the price method, and it will yield a, um, a, the price of the option. So the Black-Scholes uh, benchmark here is actually $6.96, so at 100,000 rep rep repetitions, we're coming pretty close to the true Black-Scholes price. And again, with Monte Carlo simulation, I can help them think about the option as uh, the uh, discounted average payoff, and they've, they've had to simulate through, through this process to build this code. Uh, we can do the same thing for the put option, and they can compare that again to the Black-Scholes price. I think this is a penny or two off. It's, pre it's pretty close. Um, 
So uh, I, I went a little bit fast. I, I thought I'd have more, uh, less time than this. But what's, what's next for this uh, project is to extend Probo in a couple different directions. So one is uh, a project called Preza that we intend for academic research and production, uh, hopefully. Building that with some graduate students. We're building on top of PyTorch. Um, where we want performance and we want access to GPU comp uh, compute pretty simply. Um, and uh, one of the next directions for both teaching and research is to think about another layer of abstraction that might be referred to as agent-based simulation. So one of the key concepts in uh, the Black-Scholes option pricing model, and therefore any uh, of the subsequent models, is that of the delta hedging market maker, if, if, if you're familiar with that, uh, with that vocabulary. Um, and this is a concept that is, is really challenging to help the students to think about, the idea of a, a risk-neutral density. And um, the argument in Black-Scholes is that there is a market maker who is hedging an option that has been purchased or sold. And um, through Monte Carlo simulation, we can actually simulate that behavior and show that the Black-Scholes price will be a special case of this if the assumptions of the Black-Scholes model hold. So we can take those assumptions and break them. For example, I can introduce uh, different frictions like transactions costs or discrete hedging, and we can see that that, uh, that will uh, give a more general answer than the Black-Scholes. And we're also using this with some of my graduate students in research to actually implement that as a pricing method. Um, and we refer to this as uh, hedging Monte Carlo. Um, so. I finished a little bit early, but uh, I'll, I'll take uh, some questions if anyone has some. Thank you, thank you for your time and attention. We, we do do that, yeah. So one of the things we'll do is we'll look at, say, pull up Bloomberg and we'll look at what an option's trading at and have, have that conversation, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we also we, we do other exercises like uh, build in an um, implied volatility solver so they can see what, when we take an observed option price, what kind of uh, uh, volatility does that imply? So they, they work through exercises using real world data, yeah. So it's a good question. It helps them, but now having this computational sort of framework to build with, it helps them sort of wrestle with and make that, that concept real for them, whereas just the simple mathematical symbolic representation is a little bit too abstract for them. So, yeah. Yeah. How much time are you spending on this in the course? Yeah, so th about the first month or so, I, I do a rapid uh, instruction in Python. Most of them have never programmed before, so I got to get him from there to what you just saw, doing object-oriented programming with design patterns. It's a bit fast, and I'm sure my computer science colleagues would be uh, a little bit horrified by how fast and, and, and how sloppily I go. But I get them there, and then the next two-thirds of the class, so the, the middle third is going to be uh, teaching them the, the various pricing models. So we start with the binomial model, and then we introduce Black-Scholes and the concepts of Black-Scholes, and then we work through Monte Carlo for the rest of the semester. They, the, the students then have a project at the end of the semester, and by this point, you know, we're 75 percent, 80 percent of the way through the course, and their project is to extend Probo and to build in a new pricing engine or to price a new kind of object, uh, uh, option or something like that. And so the course is just over three months, and we, it's, it's pretty ambitious, but so far we've, uh, over the last couple of years, we've, we've been able to do it. It's a full-time course. It's a full-time course on campus in our master's program. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And I had, I mean, we just created this whole cloth that, and, and I was just asked to create a course in computational finance and I had a, extreme freedom about what to do and so I, I devised this, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, excited to hear anyone's feedback on this if you have great ideas for me, so.
Yes, um, that's, I definitely can. In fact, um, maybe we shouldn't admit this, but the first year or two, I, I was ambitious enough to try C++ because I, I, uh, I, had, I had assistant professor-itis and I was going to teach them everything I knew. And, um, you know, we were still fighting compiler errors by the, by the time the finals were rolling around. Um, but yeah, I, I, by, by the time the students are working on their project to build a new pricing engine or to, to price a new option, they know how to play around and break things and discover, and so they have a computational platform with to do educational discovery on. And I've definitely uh, discovered that that uh, that it's that it's a new way to think about and teach these concepts rather than just the the, the sort of uh, austere textbook type types of teaching and you know chalk and talk kind of uh, uh, a way. And it's been a very powerful learning tool. Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. I, I do both of those. So I, I, every lecture is going to have a Jupyter Notebook attached with it, and it's going to be attached to something in their textbook um, once we get to the computational finance material. Um, but I have to go very rapidly for the first month through Python, and so I've tried different things, but I've just created, I think, 10 or 11 of my own notebooks. Um, and I don't, I'm, I don't try to teach them all of Python. I try to teach them enough to get going on the kinds of things we want to do. And they continue to learn Python throughout the semester as they need extra bits to do their, their, their exercises. But um, at, so far, it's worked pretty well. But yeah, they have a GitHub repository. And um, they know that that GitHub repository is updated each lecture. Yeah. And I, I, can, I can't imagine doing this without the notebook and these kinds of tools. Yeah. Thank you for your time and attention.